Welcome to the Speak Your Way to Cash podcast, a podcast where we teach speakers how to land paid speaking engagements and corporate contracts. Each week, we deliver high quality content that teaches you how to level up your speaking business. Be sure to join the Speak Your Way to Cash Facebook group after having your mind blown by this information filled episode. Now, here's your host, Ashley Kirkwood, lawyer and professional speaker. This is the Speak Your Way to Cash podcast. Hey guys, it's Ashley Kirkwood with Speak Your Way to Cash, the podcast. And I am very, very, very excited today because we have a very special guest, Bill Benjamin, who has been speaking and training for the last 20 years or so. And he has extensive sales experience and has really seen his organization grow from inception to where they're at now, more than 20 years later, with several trainers and consultants on staff and helping clients all over the world. So, Bill, thank you so much for joining us. Great. Happy to be here. So tell us a little bit about how you got into the speaking and training side of things and how sales led you into that path. Well, I have degrees in mathematics and computer science, which is not your typical path into speaking on topics <laughs> like intelligence uh, and performing under pressure. And so my, my story is um, I spent 14 years at a computer software company in sales and sales leadership. So I do have that sales background. But when I got promoted to being a manager, because of course, you know, what do you do? You take your, you know, successful salespeople, you make them managers. Um, I actually really struggled. Um, I, I wasn't a motivating and inspiring person to work for. Um, and that's actually 23 or so years ago when I got introduced to the work that the Institute for Health and Human Potential does around emotional intelligence. And it really helped me, um, both in my sales, um, but really also in my leadership and my personal life. So um, I got to kind of exposed as a client um, and then just, you know, love the work so much um, that I decided to, you know, join the organization a few years later. Nice. And can you tell us a little bit about the organization and the offerings that you all have? Yeah. So um, there's really two parts to our business. There's our speaking business, and that's myself and my business partner, uh, Dr. J.B. Palou Fry. So we're, you know, kind of fairly busy speakers and we, we write books and we do things like podcasts like this to kind of, you know, promote the speaking. And then that really helps drive the other part of our business, which is our training business, which is more extensive, you know, full day training programs, there's assessment, there's coaching, um, there's about 20 employees in, in, in that business. Um, as you mentioned, we have contract facilitators and coaches. Um, and, and that's really the, when I first joined, JP was really focused on the speaking and that's really what I came in to help him do was build out that training, coaching, consulting part of the business because he didn't have as much experience in sales or really honestly any experience in sales. And did, the, did you suggest that he build out the training, coaching part of the business because it develops long-term relationships with clients versus the one-off speaking engagements? Yeah, I mean, the, the, there's a couple of reasons why we do it. Um, one is that. Uh, the other is, though, that, I mean, gosh, as powerful as a one-hour keynote is, and it does change lives. I mean, multiply that by 100 when somebody attends a full-day training program, does an assessment, gets coaching. So just in terms of, you know, impacting people and making the difference in the world we want to make, um, you know, that, that training part of the business, just it goes deeper for people. Yeah, longer-term impact. Yeah, and, and then finally, you know, from a business perspective, it also creates something of value. So, you know, a speaking business that's only based on JP and myself doesn't have as much value as a training business that has intellectual property that runs on its own, that has recurring revenue. Um, and so there's also, a, you know, creating some, some value in our business. That's another reason that we, we do that. That's great. And you mentioned that before you came on board, your partner didn't have as much sales experience. So how was he getting the keynotes? So, I mean, one thing he had done is he developed a couple of relationships with some speaker bureaus and, you know, it was fairly early on. I mean, it was 23 years ago. Um, you know, these days, speaker bureaus are just inundated with people. But, you know, he was, I mean, for a guy without sales experience, he's still entrepreneurial. He's very resilient. He's very driven. Um, and he just, you know, did a great job of getting in front of a couple of key speaker bureaus that, you know, picked him up, loved his message, loved what he had to say. And that was really, so he, he ultimately, other than selling the speaker bureaus himself, didn't have to do the selling. They became the sales agents for him. Oh, that's perfect. And now a lot of speaking coaches do not recommend that because. They are so inundated, and there are so many of them now. It's hard to determine which ones already have established relationships and which ones don't so much. Yeah, I mean, we're still big fans of the speaker bureaus. Um, in fact, you know, late last year, we actually went exclusive 
um, with, with Big Speak, uh, you know, an awesome speaker bureau out in California. Um, so we're still big fans of that, of that model and that approach. Um, it's just, it, it's hard to break into if you're brand new. Yeah. Um, if you don't already have some sort of established track record. Now, there are speaker management companies, you're probably familiar with them, where you actually pay them to help you build up your brand. They'll look at your marketing materials. They'll look at your content. Um, they'll coach you on how to speak and they'll help sell you, but you're actually paying them. Right. Um, which is a different model from a speaker bureau where, you know, they're taking a, you're not paying them. They're taking a commission from your, your, your speaking fees. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, there also are speaker bureaus that only do, for instance, the collegiate market. So they would take a percentage of everything you do in that market, but you would be able to keep all of your corporate stuff a hundred percent for yourself that you bring in. So there is, there is a way to do that. And a lot of my friends who've been in the industry for a while have gone to that model just because it gets really overwhelming doing the management back in admin side of getting booked. It is a lot of work. There's probably like seven steps that a client has to go through before you get on that stage, contracting mm -hmm. W9 paperwork, insurance, exactly. stuff. all of that is just a ton to handle. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, you know, not only are you getting the marketing and sales that they're doing, but you're right, you're getting all that admin and logistics support. So, as I said, we are a fan. And, and again, you know, with a lot of speaker bureaus, you know, you don't start exclusive. Right. So, you know, basically, you know, you have your own clients, but then they bring you in the new ones that they sell. Um, so that's kind of the way that we've, we're, you know, we worked for 20 years before we decided to go exclusive. That's good. And what informed that decision to go exclusive with Big Speak? Um, you know, just that, you know, they really been of all the speaker bureaus we worked with, the ones that, you know, really kind of got passionate about what we do, kind of understood the more consultative sales approach. Um, they've been really growing. Um, so we were just seeing more and more bookings coming from them. Um, they also have a model where um, they have someone who still works with the other speaker bureaus. So going exclusive with them didn't mean we couldn't work with our current speaker bureau partners. Mm -hmm. um, and we make sure that the current speaker bureaus still get paid their full fee. Um, oh, so that's great. Costs, yeah, it costs us a little more, but it's worth it because we still wanted to maintain those other speaker bureau relationships. So, um, you know, and, and then again, when you go exclusive, there's a commitment from that speaker bureau that they're going to put more resources into marketing and selling you. Which, which is good. And that's what you want. And a lot of speakers who use bureaus also talk about how they visit their, um, their agent or whomever it is that represents them at the bureau to stay top of mind. So there's still some work for you to do because I work with a lot of new oh, yeah. speakers and train them and they are very quick to want to outsource that part of the business. But whether you go with the bureau you stay on your own, you maintaining your brand and your image is going to be critical. Absolutely. It's not an, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> definitely you've got to continue to add value, provide things that, you know, are topical for their clients. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, that's wonderful. So when the business first started, it was pretty much keynote speaking. And then how did you even start to develop out the training consulting arm of the business? Did mm -hmm. you start with developing the content? Did you start with developing the contacts? How did that transition work logistically? Yeah, I mean, a, a little bit of both. So we identified that there was opportunity to go deeper with the content. And so we did some work ourselves to, you know, to develop, take a, a one hour keynote, build it into a half day training program. Um, and then at the same time, you know, we, we were pitching that to clients. So, you know, we all sometimes have to sell things that aren't 100% there yet. So we were managing that, you know, where there was a client who just loved the keynote and wanted more, um, you know, we were pitching and saying, well, look, we've got this ability to deliver a more extensive you know, program for your leadership team or your sales team. Um, and, you know, we, we wouldn't lie to clients, obviously, and, and tell them we had something that didn't exist, but we would tell them that we were working on this and, you know, if, if they wanted to pilot with us. So, you know, we found some early clients that loved our work and were willing to pilot those longer training programs. Um, and were they bringing you in for the keynote just to speak to, to one, was it, were you going to conferences and speaking at conferences and getting in front of a variety of decision makers or were these individual clients that were bringing you in to only work with their organization? And after that went well, you would upsell them or talk to them about additional opportunities for growth for their organization. I mean, a combination of both. I'd say when it's an association where there's a bunch of, you know, kind of people in the audience they'll tend to, you know, the opportunity there tends to be for another keynote they might have at their organization. Um, 
where the training opportunities tend to come from is when you are speaking to an individual organization and you are, and, and, and you know, one of the keys that we really work at is a lot of times it's the business owner that brings you in, right? It's, it's the, you know, head of, you know, construction or it's the VP of sales um, is to actually ask if there's somebody from learning and development involved. Mm. Um, and if there isn't somebody from learning and development involved, we'll actually say, Hey, you know, how about if we connected with them to get their input mm. so that, that we can sense. make sure we're, and, and that gives us the opportunity to meet the learning and development person because in terms of, you know, selling larger training contracts, typically you're going to be working through the HR learning and development group. Um, so we leverage those keynotes, those contacts we have to get us into that, that part of the organization. That makes sense. And do you find that the learning and development person is inside of the human resources group or are they their own separate department? Um, I mean, you know, typically they're, they're under HR. Mm-hmm. Um, there might be a chief learning officer and a, and a CHRO, but that's in really, really big organizations. Yeah. So in general, it's, it's sort of put under HR. Um, but again, in some large organizations, it's separated out. That makes sense. What seems really daunting, especially as you're just getting started, if you're doing keynotes, you're fully booked on keynotes, but you do want longer term relationships, you do want reoccurring revenue because it's more sustainable and you can make a bigger impact. It seems daunting to figure out the size of the company or narrow in on the niche that you should target. So there's so many companies in in the United States, Mm -hmm. um, a lot of which have between 500 plus employees. How did you determine either the industry that you were going to narrow in on or the size of the company? Because what you do is valuable to any company yeah. that has people who are out there and who need some mindset work or emotional intelligence work. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I mean when, when I first came into IHHP, I, I really was the salesperson. Um, and so, you know, as a salesperson, you know, JP is going to go and speak to a company with 150 people. I'm probably not going to spend a lot of time as a salesperson because they don't tend to invest. They don't have training budgets. But, you know, mm-hmm. if he's going to go speak to Pfizer, you know, a pharmaceutical company, even if it's one of the smaller divisions, then as a salesperson, I'm going to focus more of my time on that. So we didn't necessarily target specific industries. We kind of followed where the speaking engagements were taking us. Okay. And then targeting, you know, identifying, you know, and, and we've done some work identifying, you know, who's a, who's a, an ideal client for us and then targeting which of those, you know, speaking engagements are with clients that meet that, that target. That makes a lot of sense as well. And how did you start growing the company? So now you all have a variety of consultants that work for you. Did you train them on your methodology? So you all built that out first, got that solid and trained other consultants. Um, And are they, are they able to license your trainings and then sell them on their own? Or how does that relationship work? Yeah, great, great question. So, I mean, one of the things that we did do, and this is a lot of work, um, it's a lot of work, <laughs> is we created a certification for our training materials. That makes and a lot of sense. The first thing I'll say is one mistake we made was when we first said, "Oh, we've got a new training program. Let's create the certification at the same time." But anytime you develop a new, tra- I mean, I mean, even when you develop an hour keynote, but when you develop a full day training program, it's going to change as you deliver it. I mean, you probably want to go through twenty, thirty deliveries before you say, okay, this is what we want to certify on. Because once you create a certification, you're creating facilitator guides, you're creating all kinds of resources. And then as soon as you change something, that has to be reflected in all the certification materials. So it becomes a much, much bigger effort. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we do now, whenever we, you know, come out with a new training program is we don't develop the certification until we've really, really run it a whole bunch of times. We have different people, you know, run it. Um, but that was a that is a model that we used where we created that certification, and then yes, we license more corporate trainers, so not so much independent consultants. We went through that model. We can talk about that if you want. Uh, we moved away from that model of independent consultants, but more corporate trainers, and then our facilitators. So we have both full time and contract facilitators, and so we use the certification both for you know the end client, but also for our own facilitators. And when you say corporate trainers, these are individuals who already work for a company. Yeah, yeah. They work at Allstate or they work at IBM. And we are then training them and then licensing them. So they are paying licensing, you know, fees in order to use the training. And, and again, that's, that's a big part of how we've grown 
the training business is through that recurring revenue, those licenses. That makes a lot of sense. How did you come up with the pricing for this? Did you already know how to price all of this out prior to getting into the business or was it trial and error? How do you oh, come I up came with in the... with no clue, absolutely no clue <laughs> as to what the pricing models were. So, you know, it, it was all of the above. I mean, it was going out and seeing what, you know, others in the industry, either peers or direct competitors were doing. Um, it was, you know, so, some trial and error with a client, you know, sometimes going in too high, sometimes, you know, going in too low and realizing, you know, whatever, six months later, boy, we could have charged a lot more for that. Um, so it was this combination of seeing what was going on in the industry and then testing things with, with clients. That makes a lot of sense. For the licensing, do they have to renew their certification or get recertified at, in, in certain intervals? Um, we didn't used to do that. We're, we're doing that more now, um, uh, having that recertification. So yes, that is something that we, 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 we look at. Hey guys, it's Ashley Kirkwood here, and I know this is an amazing interview. And if you are someone who is interested in taking your speaking career to the next level, then do I have something for you? Okay, I need you to go to Ashley Nicole Kirkwood dot com slash S Y W T C live replay. That's Ashley Nicole Kirkwood dot com slash S Y W T C live replay. The link is also in the show notes that you can grab the speak your way to cash live replay, which has seven modules, a ton of information about how you can start speaking your way to cash. Now, This training is absolutely action-packed, phenomenal. It has additional resources. It has templates. It has a podcast pitch template, um, a college pitch template, um, something you can send to media outlets to get on television. It has everything you need to develop a sales strategy, a press strategy, and a plan to skyrocket your speaking career. And it is crazy affordable, okay? So head on over there right now, ashleynicolekirkwood.com slash speak your S-Y-W-T-C live replay and grab your copy today. All right, let's get back to this interview. And with contractors or having people who actually work for your company, how do you typically get the contract first and then staff the contractors on those particular deals so that you're not over hiring or under hiring? Yeah. I mean, that's a constant conversation we have Yeah, because you're right. I mean, we do, you know, whatever 30 programs in June and, you know, 10 in, in December. And so, you know, you don't want to hire for running 30 programs a month. So we have a combination of, you know, facilitators on staff, but also contract facilitators who we only engage when we have, when we sell a program. And, and again, for somebody starting out, I mean, that's how we started out. I mean, probably in the first three years or four years, we didn't have anybody on staff who delivered our training. It was all contract facilitators. And we found a couple of really great ones who, you know, in some ways became like they were part of the company, right? They would help in the design. They would help in the, you know, in, in that. Um, but really, we only paid them when they delivered. So that was a model that, that, that worked well, really, and continues to work well for us. That's, that's really great. And um, it's, it's interesting because I wonder, it seems like your business is not personality driven. And because of that, you're able to have other trainers deliver the keynotes. And for a lot of speakers, it is a person, personality driven business. Mm-hmm. They are the brand. And so sure. when you're selling to a client and it's you that's selling, sometimes a client wants you they don't necessarily they're more sold on you than they are on the content how do you walk that line when it comes to branding and ensure that the client is as sold on the content regardless of who delivers it yeah i mean honestly even though we are the institute for health and human potential when jp and i are the ones who delivered the content they're they're connected to us so we absolutely run into that issue and you know know, sometimes that comes down to trust and the fees. Mm. So, I mean, our fees are much higher than the facilitators. So, you know, if the client wants to, you know, again, roll this out to, you know, 80 people and run four or five training programs, paying JP and I each time is going to be much more expensive than bringing in a, than bringing in a facilitator. So it's, it's somewhat of them trusting in us that we would only hire great facilitators. And, um, and then it's also just the, the financial model for them doesn't necessarily work to be paying JP and I. And I mean, some clients still do like, okay. I mean, JP and I still occasionally deliver half day and full day programs, but again, that's typically somebody's senior team. You know, it's, it's a very high end. They're willing to invest the extra money in us. Um, but as they roll out to say a mid-level manager group, 
you know, they're not going to be able to afford to bring JPRI in every time. And with the half day or full day programs, do they also get consulting or are there different packages? So we have, yeah, we have assessments, um, we have coaching. Um, so we do have, we have some other sustainment solutions. So yeah, we have other uh, services around, not so much consulting, but more uh, training sustainment solutions and assessments. Okay, great. And thus far, it seems like we've talked a lot about the in-person training models, the half mm-hmm. day and full day trainings, which I love. I think they're super effective for companies and you do deepen the relationship in person, even though the world is moving to online. So how did you all first get into the online um, development space and how have you been able to build that out? Yeah, I mean, dragged kicking and screaming. <laughs> um, you know, JP and I, we're, we're old school, we're classroom folks. Um, but we just had some of our big global clients like United Health Group. I mean, they have 300,000 employees all over the world now who said, guys, we love your training, but we just can't afford to fly everyone into classrooms. And, and they were already doing a lot of stuff virtually. Um, and so we partnered with <coughs> um, United Health Group in particular, also IBM, um, and you know, developed our, our, our training. One, one real lesson, and this seems so obvious in hindsight, but we really did go down that path of saying, okay, we're just going to take our classroom training and kind of deliver it virtually and just take our exercises and run it virtually versus going and, and that didn't work as well, to be honest. We did have a false start out of the gate. Um, it wasn't as engaging. It wasn't as, you know, interactive. <clears throat> and so we ended up going and finding some contract people who knew virtual, who knew how to design. And, and, and when I say virtual, I don't necessarily just mean self-paced. I mean um, what we call live online where it's virtually facilitated. It's using like a Zoom platform. So there's virtual breakout groups. There's, you know, kind of interaction with a facilitator. Um, and there's definitely some really specific approaches, techniques to use to make that really engaging to keep, you know, to keep the person sitting at their desk really engaged. And so we hired some people who really understood how to design those pro design that way you know, kind of taught them our content versus the other way around. Um, once we did that, oh, yeah, I, I got to tell you, I, I, I have been surprised at the feedback that we've gotten about how interactive it is. Because one of the advantages is when you are taking somebody for a full day or a two-day training program, I mean, that's a lot, right? Not only, you know, are they out of the office for a day and their emails are piling up, but it's just a lot of rich content. Whereas, you know, our virtual, we, we've taken it and made it three two-hour sessions mm-hmm. that we spread over multiple days, even multiple weeks. And so instead of that full fire hose full day, it's like, okay, two hours, I can deal with that in my day, I can set some time aside for two hours, but then they've got time to process it, right? So it's very interactive, it's very engaging, and they're taking away, they're practicing things, they're trying things, and then they're coming back together. So it creates some natural sustainment. Um, so there's actually some elements of doing things virtually that are better than classroom. Um, and is, still, it, is it live? So it's virtual, but it's still live. Correct. Correct. So there is a facilitator. Um, your, your listeners can't see right now, but Ashley and I are on video on Zoom and we can see each other. Right. So as I'm saying something, you're acknowledging and nodding, and then I'm seeing that you're ready to say something and you're engaging, and it really feels, it, it's almost like we're in a room together, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, and so that th- this using, so you know, you might have a training class of 25 people. You know, there, if you ask someone to put their hand up and engage, you're going to get crickets. But you put them into a virtual breakout room where mm-hmm. there's only two or three people on video together. It's just like saying, it's just like, in a ver- it's just like in a classroom saying, okay, now turn to the person beside you and discuss this. Right. Um, the facilitator can, quote, walk around to each of the virtual breakout rooms. People can put their hands up. So it, it really does emulate an interactive environment in, in a, in a live classroom. Um, and so that's the part that's really, we've been able to use to make it more engaging. And that, that makes a lot of sense when it's live because you still have some control over the attention of the, the audience. Yeah. Um, and do you all use the zoom platform for that? Yeah. Yeah. Now we have clients that use other platforms. So, you know, we're platform agnostic, mm-hmm. um, but for us, the simplest and most effective and cost effective has been zoom. Yeah. And what about on demand? Do you offer those as well? We do. We do. We developed that for IBM. Um, I'm, I'm personally not as big a fan, um, but you know, it's funny. They just said, you know, we're a technology company. That's the way our people learn. They will yeah. sit and you know, we, 
we worked really hard to make it engaging. There's live videos, there's interactive exercises, um, you know, but you know, I, I'm not as big a fan of that in terms of, you know, how many people really sit and go through all the modules, but you know, that was something that they felt was, was the approach they really wanted to use and work for them. So um, we actually now have that available, you know, on, on demand, you know, if people want to, but I don't push that as much because I think it's hard when you're kind of by yourself. Yeah, it is. And so with the, cause I think the biggest hurdle for myself and probably for other, um, other folks is the technology overcoming the, the intimidation of the technology that it would take to truly make an on-demand interactive client experience. And yeah. it's, it's different. <laughs> it's very different. So did you all have, do you all have like pop-up questions and things of that nature? And was that, did you hire out like someone who could code that out or how did that work? So we, so again, when we first did this, we tried it ourselves. Okay. And, and honestly, I mean, the Zoom, it, it's less about the technology. I mean, the Zoom platform is pretty easy. It's pretty easy to design mm-hmm. a poll. It's pretty easy to do a whiteboard. By the way, whiteboards where you've got like 20 people all filling things in are extremely interactive. It keeps people's attention. So whiteboards are really powerful. So the technology itself, that, that's fairly easy to learn. It's, so even on demand, someone can do a poll on Zoom and when they're yeah. doing Will it spit out a certificate at the end to make sure that they completed it? Yeah, yeah. So you can track and say this person is, and again, that's that's more about the platform that you host it on. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, again, the thing I'll say is the mistake we made was thinking, okay, we, we know our emotional intelligence content. We'll just learn the virtual. We'll just learn how to use whiteboards and breakout rooms, and we'll be able to develop great training. My, my coaching to your listeners, if they want to develop virtual training, is find someone, contract with someone who knows actually how to design really great virtual programs. I mean, teach them your content, but how to really create a two hour experience where it's really engaging throughout the whole time. You know, that takes a unique skill that, you know, most of us as speakers and trainers don't have. Definitely. And that's good advice. That's great advice because if it's something that you're not good at for me if it takes me longer than a week or two to figure something out I'm searching for the best consultant it just saves it just saves me time and when I was practicing when I was a practicing attorney the rule of thumb is if you're looking for a case or authority for longer than two hours you need to get in the the room with someone else and talk it through yeah I mean this is much longer than two hours so absolutely (laughs) that's my recommendation yep definitely so you speak on emotional intelligence and also coming, getting over stage fright and some of those things. For some of the speakers, a lot of the speakers that I work with are very concerned about how to book engagement. Right. However, the way that you rebook engagements is by being exceptional on stage. Right. Because that is going to carry the weight. And people will refer you because they like referring people they can trust. How do you suggest people get better um, if they do have stage fright? What would you say they need to be doing on a daily, monthly, or weekly basis to overcome that? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I want to say is to absolutely normalize the experience of feeling nervous and anxious before speaking. I, I've been doing this for 18 years, and I still have some groups. I, I've got 120 physicians for three hours in two weeks. Okay, that makes me nervous. They're doctors. I'm going to try and teach them emotional intelligence. So um, it's, it's, first of all, it's absolutely normal to have some anxiety and fear, um, and, 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 you know, our approach, and we wrote a book that's you know, right over my shoulder that your listeners can't see, but uh, you can see. What's the name of the, is it Under Pressure? It's called Performing Under Pressure. Performing Under Pressure. Um, and, and the really important thing for people to understand um, is a bit about the brain um, in that when we're under pressure, there's two parts to our brain. There's our cognitive brain. That's where we do our best thinking. That's where we have our best articulation. That's where we share ideas. That's where our passion and our purpose and all that stuff comes from. Then there's our emotional brain. Um, and our emotional brain is part of our fear center. So when we perceive a threat, our emotional brain goes into action. If we're in the jungle where there's a serious threat and a tiger jumps out at us, that emotional part of the brain is going to release chemicals, cortisol and adrenaline, that is going to get us ready for fight or flight. And that's what we want in that moment. However, when we're sitting, you know, uh, you know, in the hour before a presentation in the back of the room, feeling anxious and nervous, we don't want those fight or flight chemicals. Because one of the chemicals that get re- gets released is cortisol, which is our stress hormone. 
Um, in addition, those chemicals actually reduce our working memory, so we, we can't think as clearly. So we're not going to be as agile on stage. So number one, we want to recognize when that emotional part of our brain is starting to trigger. So what is this, the self-awareness of when that happens? Couple just, so then the question becomes, okay, great. Yes, my emotional brain sometimes triggers before I'm about to give a presentation. Yep. Um, what do I do? This is going to sound so obvious, but it's so important, is breathing. <laughs> our emotional system actually wants to shorten our breath, right? Because it's, it's, it's ready for fight or flight. So those, you know, deep conscious breaths, I, I can't tell you how many times, you know, maybe I'm driving over to a program or, you know, getting ready and, and I notice my, my breath is shortened. So even after all the experience I've, I've had, I notice my system. So, so, so deep breathing um, is, is one. Another thing is um, there was some really interesting research done by Amy Cuddy, um, who has a really amazing TED talk on the whole idea of power posing. And there's, yeah. been, some, there's been some questions on all of her research. But the part of the research that is true is that when we sit in a closed and contracted position, our shoulders hunched, we start to lose confidence. We start to get a little more anxious. Whereas if we're standing in what she calls a power pose and our shoulders are back and we're standing up straight, we actually start to feel more confident. Okay, I cannot tell you how many times before I learned that, that I would be at a client event. And they'd be like, hey, Bill, you know, come and sit at the front table before your session. And I'm sitting at the front table, and the guy before me is presenting like 45 minutes of death by PowerPoint, and I'm just feeling the energy drain out of me. I don't do that anymore. I never sit before one of my presentations. At least 10 minutes, and, and I tell the client I'm going to do this. I'll say, look, 10 minutes before my session, I, I, like, I might sit for a bit. I normally sit at the back because I don't want to get up if I'm at the front. So I, I don't sit at the front. I sit at the back if they want me there. But I tell them, look, 10 minutes before I'm going to stand up. And I stand at the back of the room. And sometimes even if I'm really nervous, I go out of the room so I can do some real kind of, you know, energy stuff, you know, making myself big, stretching. Um, but even though I'm standing at the back of the room, I'm just standing up straight. And, and I found that makes such a difference to my energy before getting on stage. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, you guys, it is normal to feel nervous or excited. I, I like to call it excited before you speak. And no matter how much you speak or how great you are at speaking, that's just energy. It's just energy. You're excited about what you're about to do. And it's going to take some practice before you learn that, before you trust yourself enough to know that once yeah. you start speaking, once you're into your your speech, you're going to do better. Hey guys, Ashley Kirkwood here, and I just want to take a moment to invite you out to the Speaker Way to Cash retreat. If you enjoy this podcast, then you will love the Speaker Way to Cash 2020 retreat in October, taking place right outside Chicago, Illinois. This retreat is for speakers looking to grow their speaking businesses, land corporate or college clients, and skyrocket their earning potential as a speaker. The in-depth sessions at this multi-day retreat will leave you understanding exactly the high-level client, ac client acquisition strategies that I use to land corporate clients. You'll also know the exact steps you need to be taking to grow your current business. Let's get to the nitty gritty. The sessions are amazing. We talk about selling your signature speech and we actually have time to go over the techniques of speaking. So if you want to become a better speaker as well as a higher paid speaker, then you should come out. We have another session called TEDx Secrets. Bring your laptops. We are actually going to be looking up and applying to TEDx Talks at the retreat. This session will be critical if you're someone who wants to land a TEDx Talk. Client Secrets. You'll hear from actual clients about what they want from speakers just like you and selling success. We cannot do a retreat without talking about selling. But here's the session that I'm most excited about. We are going to do a vision organizational chart party. That means we are going to have not just vision boards, but vision org boards. We are going to map out how your speaking organization should be staffed, what you want that to look like, and how to use global outsourcing in a way that lets you fund the positions in your company that are currently open. So it's for you if you're ready to level up. If so, meet me in Chicago in October. Reserve your seat now. I'm only taking 30 speakers on this retreat. So go to AshleyNicoleKirkwood.com slash 2020 retreat. And the best part is you can get early bird pricing now of $550 or you can reserve your seat 
for just $75 down and make payments until the retreat. That's right. You can either pay in full and get early bird pricing of $550 for the entire two day experience, or you can reserve your seat for just $75 down. Whatever you decide to do, make sure you're in the room. It's going to be impactful. And I'm ready to help you start speaking your way to cash in person in Chicago in October. Again, the website is ashleynicolekirkwood.com slash 2020 retreat. See you soon. Can't wait, guys. Another thing I wonder um, if you could speak to is how much confidence comes from being competent in your topic area. So I imagine you know your speech like the back of your hand. So things that I over-prepare for, it doesn't matter if I have those nervous feelings or not. I know that I am going to do a good job because I have over-prepared for this opportunity. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. In fact, I mean, that's what's giving me some confidence with the physicians. You know, like I have delivered this emotional intelligence training program 500 times, right? Like I know this content. I know my material. You know, my job is going to be to make it relevant to them, To you know, but I know the material. So, so that gives me confidence. Um, having said that, there's t- there are times when we're delivering new material. So, for example, when the Performing Under Pressure book first came out, I was asked to deliver it to 150 U.S. Marines. Mm. Now, I'm not a military guy, so I would have been right. nervous delivering the emotional intelligence content. But to deliver something brand new, oh my gosh, I'll always remember driving over to Fort Sheridan um, here in Chicago, and I was the most nervous I'd, I'd been in a long time. Um, that would be, I mean, it really wouldn't matter what the topic is, delivering any speech to a hundred of the toughest men that you may have ever met in your life may be a little nerve wracking to any speaker. Absolutely. So, um, and funny, and the funny thing was on the way over, I thought, well, I should probably use some of the techniques I'm about to teach to perform under pressure. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and one of the ones that really, really helps, um, and again, I, by the way, I, there's, there's 22 pressure solutions in the book, so you tell me when to stop talking about uh, you know, strategies, but, but one of them is um, this idea of what we call befriend the moment. Um, mm. and, and we do this with Olympic athletes, right? Right, right before an event, you know, they're going to feel tension and anxiety, and instead of reacting to it and trying to push it away and push it down, is to say, oh, that's my, that anxiety, that tension, that's my body getting ready to perform. That's okay. And so that, that, that's a frame of mind that we really coach. And, and again, when I feel that, I'm like, okay, this is okay that I'm having this anxiety. Um, and, and then what tends to happen is the reason we're having the anxiety is because we all tend to focus on what we call crisis thinking. Yes. It's our natural response. So I, I'm going to deliver this program for 150 U.S. Marines. You know, it's not going to go well. It's not going to apply to them. They're not going to like it. I don't know what U.S. I don't know what U.S. Marines do when they don't like a speaker, but it can't be good. <laughs> it can't be good. It can't be good, right? <laughs> so if we can shift, so this is another strategy: shift from crisis to opportunity thinking. Mm, yes. Because the crisis thinking actually constricts our blood vessels, which means less oxygen gets to our our brain. So we can't be as effective. Whereas if we can shift to opportunity. So again, as I'm driving around, I'm thinking, wait a minute. I mean, what an opportunity to bring this learning to people who serve our country in an amazing way. And if it goes well, they're going to invite me back and they're going to buy more books. And you know, suddenly I can feel my blood vessels dilating and more energy and oxygen is getting back into my system. So if we can focus more on, and, and that's also where we can get into, you know, sort of purpose and gratitude. So that's the other thing, right? If you're standing at the back of the room and you're feeling nervous because you're worrying about uh, they're not going to like it, it's not going to go well, if you can shift to, well, what an opportunity to make an impact and connect with your purpose of I'm, I'm here to make a difference for people. And God, how lucky am I to get to do this work, right? Because by the way, how many times do us as speakers, do people say, God, I wish I got to do what you do? Yeah. <laughs> right. So, you know, so as you're shifting into opportunity thinking, you can also start leveraging some more positive emotions like purpose, like gratitude. Um, and that just really calms the whole emotional system down and allows us to step in more skillfully. It really does. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about how I can use these techniques as I prepare to have my first child, like opportunity thinking. Not oh, they do you. tell you, they do tell you that your mindset is everything and that women who are positive throughout their entire pregnancy and who have great experiences and are filled with gratitude, have easier delivery. So I have been really practicing positive thinking, which my husband tells everyone that I am actually more calm and more peaceful during pregnancy than ever before. 
Well, good. I don't know how to take that, but I'm going to take it. Well, first of all, congratulations. Second of all, good for you. That is brilliant. That is going to have a positive affect on your baby and on you. And by the way, on your husband. (laughs) Yes, definitely on him. You know. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's just a whole lot of great research and you've probably heard, you've obviously heard of it around when we think thoughts of grateful, of, of, of ha- connecting to our purpose, you know, what that does for our brains and our bodies. So yeah, there's lots of application to that. Cri- the other thing I'll say about, you know, I reacted a bit to the idea of opportunity, it always having to shift to opportunity thinking, because sometimes there's just stuff that sucks mm-hmm. that we just have to deal with. So we actually say shift into crisis from crisis thinking to challenge or opportunity thinking. So sometimes something, it's just a challenge that I have to overcome. Mm-hmm. That still helps. That still shifts us from crisis thinking to recognizing a challenge and shifting to what do I need to do to overcome that and get past it. So, you know, I mean, sometimes when there's something that's just really hard, okay, there isn't an opportunity in, you know, getting a really bad medical diagnosis. Right, right. <laughs> you know, but that's a challenge I need to overcome, right? And, and again, that, that can be motivating. Definitely. And every successful person that I've studied talks about the value, the importance, and the results they've received from living in a, a state of gratitude. So that really is, I mean, that really is a powerful concept. It's just when you think about how grateful you are to have been on this earth for however long you've been on this earth, to have a place to live, to have a client, to have an opportunity, even a difficult client. It's a blessing you have any clients. Like there are people that are still working to get their first client. And that may have been you even like a short period of time ago. For you, it was a long time ago. But for some of the people listening, remember how it felt to get your first client. You were very, very, very excited and thought that the world was going to open up. And now it has. So live in gratitude for sure. Yo, I still remember my first client. Absolutely. <laughs> I think everyone does. I think everyone does. Like Partly because client. it was such a low kind of, if I can say cheap organization and a low fee, they put me in this horrible motel. I mean, it was, yep. you know, and I'm, I'm not a, like, I got to be in a five-star hotel guy. I'm pretty easy going, but this one was, so the whole experience was just really, <laughs> really funny compared to, you know, wh- where I am now. Yeah. Definitely. No, that I, I totally understand that. I mean, I used, I started speaking at colleges. Mm. And so a lot of colleges, the smaller ones especially, are in smaller towns. Yeah. And they don't have four-star hotels or even three-star hotels. Right. There's just like the extended stay or something like that, which my husband thinks is hilarious that I stayed at an extended stay because he knows how I'm pretty particular about sheets more so than hotels. Right. <laughs> it's like, I like really good sheets. But that doesn't happen. But it was still a blessing to get those opportunities and to impact those students' lives. But it is, it is exciting to see the growth and the things, the places that this career can take you. Yeah. The, the, the thing I want to say, and you just did a podcast on resilience, so we don't have to. I, I encourage you know folks to listen to your podcast on resilience. But you know, in, in 18 years of doing this, it's not been a straight line up. I mean, we have had periods and years where our speaking was down. I mean, obviously, you know, SARS had a big impact on us and. Let's all hope the corona, the coronavirus doesn't. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, we went through that. Uh, we went through obviously the you know the the, the financial downturn, um, and there's just been years. And and so you know the idea that you know we're all going to go through the peaks and valleys. And you know when you're in the peak, you can't see the valley, but when you're in the valley, you can't see the peak. <laughs> um, I've just now developed the confidence to know that you know what um, we might go through some hard times, but we're going to you know make this work. We're going to continue. We're going to get through it. Um, and so just, you know, if, if, if some listeners are in a place where it's like, gosh, I'm not getting the bookings I want or things have slowed down or that's okay. That's, that's normal too. Um, and you know, we all know the stories of people who have faced setbacks, didn't let those things get them down, stayed resilient, um, and you know, have, have overcome. And so that's just such an important part of, you know, growing a business um, is, is that resilience piece. Yes. Trusting that it will work out when it doesn't. Because I do find that there's an energy you give off when you're in a state of desperation that repels yeah. clients. So you can't be at the point where it's like, okay, you quote them 7,500 and they're like, well, we don't have that. And you're like, all right, $1,000. Like, right. You don't want to get in that state. It's just so much easier to almost, I, I remember when I first started my company, I had to almost force myself into a place of peace because mm. if I didn't, I would do, I would like sell out of desperation or look for clients that weren't a good fit and it just does not work. 
And people can feel that energy. So it is really, really important to trust yourself, trust your journey, and know that it will work out because it really does work out. It it, it does. Uh, And and I think that's such great advice. Um, My business partner, JP, often says, it can feel like success in the middle of failure. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't isn't that good? That is really good. That is really, really good. Well, this has been amazing. Where can our listeners find you, your company, um, and learn more about your book and the other products that you all offer? Yeah, thanks for asking. So um, we're the Institute for Health and Human Potential. It's IHHP.com. Um, you know, if they want to learn about the live online training, that's IHHP.com slash live online. Uh, the book is Performing Under Pressure. That's available, you know, anywhere, anywhere you buy books. Um, and I, I just want to thank you, Ashley, so much. I mean, you know, I, I love what you're bringing to, to speakers. You know, again, this has been inspiring for me. <laughs> you know, okay. I've been doing this for 18 years, and I remember what it was like when I was new. So I think it's great that there's somebody like you who's offering this, you know, kind of valuable content for people that are new. Um, and so, you know, kudos to you for doing the work you do. Thanks so much. Well, please do follow up with Bill and his team and get the book Performing Under Pressure. Um, I know it's going to be valuable just based on everything I've read about the company and meeting you here semi in person virtually. (laughs) But this has been phenomenal. So guys, thank you so much for listening to the Speak Your Way to Cash podcast and be sure to leave us a review and I'll talk to you guys next time. All right. Wasn't that interview amazing? If you're anything like me, you have pages full of notes. But here's the thing. Before you head out, I want you to go to Facebook.com and join the Speak Your Way to Cash Facebook group. That is where I am. That's where a ton of other speakers are, a ton of other people who listen to the show. All We all congregate there and chat. And it's 100% free. Now, if you're ready to take your speaking career to the next level, I have two ways for you to do that. One, you can go to ashleynicolekirkwood.com slash SYWTC live replay and pick up the live replay. That training is seven modules, chock full of information. It's crazy. Go over there, read all about it. Or if you want a more personal experience, you're already, you already know that you want to be a speaker. You're ready to fully commit and you want someone to walk you through it and save you tons of time Googling and doing it on your own. Then book a VIP day with me. You can go to AshleyNicoleKirkwood.com. Scroll down until you see the VIP day section and get more information on that there. All right. Thank you guys again for watching. Please do not forget to leave us a review. That is how we keep this train rolling and get some of the best speakers in the world to get on this show. So please, please, please leave a review. Shoot me a message on Facebook or Instagram and Facebook in the Speaker Way to Cash group, Instagram at at the Ashley Nicole show. And I'd be more than happy to chat with you and say hi. All right, y'all have an awesome, awesome day.